This morning we're going to take a look in Matthew. Yep. All right. Matthew 18. We're going to spring off on this. I, I've been really heavy hearted. I don't know about you. I mean, I don't know if it's the long COVID or what, but you turn around and watch what's going on in the world today and the news and Things are just getting darker. I think more people are struggling. We are, as a nation, at each other's throats. The families are divided. And we're seeing such a, 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 a darkness sweep over. And within my eye, I couldn't help but remember and, and think of that resurrection morning. This morning we were out at Sandy Point Beach and waiting for the sun to come up. The passage we read was about Mary who, who ran to the, to the tomb and the stone rolled away. And yet, in the middle of her darkness, in the middle of that strife that she was going through, is what she felt. And she had no hope. And that's the thing with, with the darkness, that in here we, we see that we're robbed of our hope. And sometimes the darkness is in our mind. So many people are struggling with depressions and loneliness. And that darkness creeps in. Sometimes we see what's going around the world and the world has changed so much. And you ever wonder, I, I, I know, Lord, what's kind of going on in this world? And in here, the scriptures becomes that standard for us. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. We talk about prayer, we talk about this country, and today every church should be filled. As people seek out God. And yet, I believe there is a spiritual warfare going on who is clouding the minds, blinding them from the truth. And that truth is God. That truth is Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And what a perfect weekend to cap that off of, of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Of all these things he did for us. Jesus likes it this way. Jesus likes parables. Because I think some people are asking, what's been going on in our country? You know, I'm not that old. Now, it's funny I say that, and some of you are like, oh, you're just a kid. And then some of you are like, man, you're an old man. So I figure I'm middle age. I'm kind of right smack down in the middle. So both sides point at me and laugh. But Jesus talks about what was going to happen. And he uses a parable. He says, And another parable be put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed in his field. If we extrapolate this back out, and we look at this world, the Bible says that God created this world good. That in here, he created the garden, and he created Adam and Eve, and there was no sin, and there was no strife, there was no division. And there was only one rule, don't eat of the fruit. And Adam and Eve took of that fruit. And because of that, sin entered into this world. And man, it's been running rapid since. And that sin, while it pleases us, we, we have a tendency within ourselves to want it, to desire it. It destroys us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death is brought about. And we see this as, as a country, and we see this as individuals. As we pursue sinful things, it destroys us. And what happens is you're left trying to run around patch all the hurt, all the consequences of all my choices. And Jesus has come to the root cause. This world, some will point their their fists at God and shake and said, God, why have you allowed these things? And we brought it in. 
We brought it in, not God. But he created things good, and he uses this parable, and he says, look, he sowed some good seeds. But while men slept, you can see this theme of darkness, what happens in the dark. He says, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, among the wheat and went his ways. And when the grain is sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you want, did you sow the good seed in the field? How does it have tares, right? Why are there so many weeds in this world? And the Bible says that an enemy has come in and planted it among us. And it's sprouting and taking over. Now, I was talking to someone before the service about gardens, and, and they are an expert gardener. I am not. I, I, I can't grow nothing. You know, every year we try to do it, I'll, you know, go out and I'm all ambitious. And you, you plow up the land and you plant the seed and you watch it go up. You know, and at first, like the first week or so, you're like, oh, this is really cool. And then, you, you know, you go out there and pick a few of the weeds. Then after a while, you realize, wait a minute, this is a commitment. This is almost like worse than having a puppy. Right? And, and all of a sudden the weeds are getting up and it takes more. Then you're out there and you got the, the mosquitoes and the black flies and oh yeah, yeah, right? Then it gets hot and sticky and I know I'm whiny. That's why I don't garden. And so anytime I've tried to do a garden, what happens at the end of the year, it becomes a game called Let's Find the Veggies. And so the garden weeds are this high and I'm pawing through because there are some cucumbers in here. You know you're a bad gardener, right? You don't take care of your garden when you cannot find the pumpkins. I mean, they're like this. And they're orange. It's almost like God saying, hey, you know what? You're an idiot. You can find these. And yet I still struggle. Where did all the weeds come from? And we're in a day and age where so many people are overcome by the weeds of their life. I think as a nation, we're being strangled by the weeds that have come and overcome the good. And so we can say, Pastor, wow, this is such an encouraging message you have for us this morning, right? This Resurrection Sunday, yay, way to encourage us. I, I just want to be honest with you at where I'm seeing things, that this world is dark. And maybe your life is dark. Maybe the darkness has crept in. But see, Easter isn't about that. It's about overcoming the darkness. On Friday, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and was buried. But Sunday morning, he arose. At the dawn, a new light came onto the scene. And so there's three areas I want to point to this morning about how to overcome the darkness. Maybe it's a personal darkness in your life. Maybe a societal darkness. Maybe, you know, you're getting to the point where you're just like, I'm going to age myself. Does anyone remember the old commercial, Kelgon, Take Me Away? Right? Some of you are like, what? That's that middle age thing. The first thing is, look for the light. And look for the light of the cross. The Bible says this about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life is, was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now Jesus Christ is that Word that came. Word became flesh, and He came to shine a light for us. But not everyone has received it. Because, see, some people like the darkness. And you watch what's going on, and sometimes I'm just shaking my head. And things that used to be done in private, things that used to be shameful, are now just brought out, or people are celebrating And when you shine the light of the gospel upon their life, you mention God. They, they cringe because the light exposes. 
And I think going forward, if our nation continues where it is, as Christians, I believe that we're going to be more marginalized. We'll be pushed aside. They're not going to want to hear us because we speak the truth. John says this, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. See, the first fact is that we are sinners. We have brought sin into this world. I struggle with sin. There are appetites that I have that aren't right. And the world's like, hey, it feels good, do it, right? Do it, it makes you happy. Well, the problem is it doesn't bring you joy. That the sin is the problem. And Jesus came and Anytime we talk about that, you know, we talk about Christmas and, you know, we give gifts and sing and carol and we have all those things. And sometimes we forget that underneath all of that is that Jesus came into this world. But why he came was to die for your sins and mine. We deserved that and he took it upon himself. Jesus uses an illustration out of the Old Testament. And hopefully you can follow with this. Hopefully I explained it well enough. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus points to a story of the Old Testament. And Israel was rebelling against God, and serpents came into. Anyone like snakes? Anyone not like snakes? We were doing a vacation Bible school, and uh, it was a desert theme, so I had a reptilian or a reptile person bring all their snakes, and uh, they pulled out this eight-foot python, and they're like, "Pastor, let's wrap this around you." Well, they brought that out. About half the ladies ran downstairs and hid in the basement. I put this on. It's like, oh, this is great. Take a picture. And has anyone ever held a python or a boa? They're, they're strong. And so it, it wrapped it around me, took a picture. Great. And they're like, okay, let's take him off. And the owner was like, oh, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to let go of you. He likes you. And try to, the more you try to move him, the tighter he started to. It was, he was looking at me. He was looking at me. Probably too salty for him. But snakes came into the camp and started to bite, and there were poisonous snakes, and people were, were being bit, and people were dying, and they called out to God. And, and what God told Moses to do was take a rod and put a bronze snake on it. And he lifted it up, and he said, Whoever looks upon the serpent will be healed. And people did. They looked up, and they were healed. Jesus points this out, and he says, Look, Jesus says, I am like that serpent. I am the one who's been lifted up. And if any of you will come and look at me and accept me, you'll be healed. Not of snake bites. And, but your sins will be taken care of. That's what the cross is for. Good Friday, just a few days ago. We remember that Jesus Christ died on the cross, a horrible death. Not because of anything he has done, but because of us. The Bible says, if you will look to him, yeah, I, that beacon, I think so many people are lost. And look, where's my bearings? Which way do I go? And we're wandering around like blind people in the dark. And so many people are looking for an answer. And when God says, look at Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on him. I've never ever been lost. Now, I'm a man. I'm never supposed to admit I, I got lost. Early in our marriage, I convinced my wife. I said, let's go down to New York City. We were in school in, in Buffalo. I got off work, so we made a, a midnight run down to 
which is probably about four or five hours, to get to New York City. And uh, I'd never been to New York City. I've never driven in New York City. Well, it's funny because we got down, down there, and uh, so we're lost. My wife told me she could read a map. She lied to me. She figured out how to do it on the way down there. We didn't have GPS. Remember life before Google, right? Remember that? Remember you actually had to fold the thing, and you could never fold it back, right? And so we get down to New York City, and we're down there, and I'm like, I mean, I have to get back to work by the afternoon, and so we have a very short period of time. We're like, okay, we're in New York City. What do you want to do? I said, let's go find that, the, the Sears Towers. Let's go find the Sears Towers. We'll take an elevator ride up to the top, look around, come back down, and we'll, we'll leave, and we, we had a fun trip. Well, we got there, and I got lost in New York City. I knew we were in trouble when we saw the sign that said, Harlem Psychiatric Hospital. Yeah. And it was dark, and every time we, you know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm a good country boy. So, you know, I come to a stoplight, I stop. Well, there's no traffic, there's no one there. So I'm still stopping, my wife's like, just drive. Just, because when we stopped, piles of garbage would move and, and people would pop out of them. And so one of these guys came running over to the car. It's like, hey, do you have a dollar? And he's trying to open the door. And I'm waiting for the light to turn green. My wife's like, go, 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 go. And so I finally went and we were so lost. Uh, but we finally got to a point where we could look up and we could see the top of the Sears Tower. Ah, okay, I have a bearing. So we slowly drove over just looking for the top of the tower. Just go that way, go that way. And we made our way and we got there and it was like 7.30 in the morning. We parked. I wasn't prepared for how much it would cost to park. And uh, so we got up to the tower, came up, and the elevator didn't open till 9. And we had to leave. So we went outside, looked up, got in the car, and drove home. <laughs> But I didn't know where I was going. I, I had no vision. All I could do is keep my eyes on the point and keep following it. Folks, Christ says he is lifted up. Follow the cross. Look for that. If you don't know where to go, seek him out. Books of Acts says, And open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the powers of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. Folks, turn your eyes to the light. Turn away from the darkness. Cry out to the God who loves you, who gave everything for you. Offer a way of forgiveness. You know, I find it interesting. If I was up here offering to, to pay off the mortgage of your home, so many of you would jump right on that and say, oh yeah, pay my debt, pay my debt. I'm telling you this morning, Jesus came up and he offers forgiveness for your sin. And so many people neglect it. The way is paid. Look for the light of the cross. Second light I want to take a look at is we're celebrating this morning, the light from the tomb. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. I am the resurrection and the life. There is life in him. And he's proved that. Death could not hold him. The Bible says that he risen just as he said. He had told the disciples that he was going to die. He was going to be buried. And three days later, he'd rise from the dead. He told them that. Have you ever made a promise you couldn't keep? Right? I mean, I'm a married man with kids. Right? <laughs> and you know what? The problem with that sometimes comes in is because we don't know, right? I don't know what's going to happen. You know? I remember promising my daughter we were going to have a birthday party for her and uh, COVID hit. You know, so I said, ah, we can't do it. We, we, you know, at that point, no one knew what was going on. We can't get out. We can't even get together with family. I'm sorry, we can't have a party. And, you know, you know your kid throws back. Well, you promised. 
Well, Dad has to break that promise because of things I didn't understand. See, God doesn't have that problem. God keeps every promise he makes because he knows the beginning from the end. Nothing catches him by surprise. Sometimes I made promises and I, I didn't have the power to keep them. Right? I thought I could do it I, and I just couldn't. Maybe I, I didn't have the finances or, or maybe the ability or things weren't working out. Right? You ever been in that place? God doesn't have that because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God is all powerful. He rose from the dead. Your situation isn't too hard for him. Look to the tomb. The light shines up. There is life. He said he came to give life and give it abundantly. God wants to give you a joy and a life that this world cannot have. It's interesting how the world plays that game. Because the promise is, look, if, if you just be yourself, or if you do, just do this, or you just satisfy that, right? If you just do this, then you'll be happy. Some of you have been around long enough, right? You've done those things. You've lived that life. And get what happens? You're not happy. You know, I find it interesting. Probably, you know, 100 years from now, the Lord doesn't come back. Someone's got to dig up all these old commercials and, if you live your life according to commercials, right? If you just drink the right, right, right beverage, all of a sudden, man, you're going to be good looking and you'll be happy. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. He says, look to the cross. Look for the new life. He changes us. He'll bring us around. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, if you're living just for this life, you are a miserable person. Because there's got to be more. I didn't understand this so much when I was younger, but as I get older, you know, when I get to a point where I, I, you know, I'm 55, chances are I'm not going to live to be 110, so I'm beyond half-life. You know, I got more behind me than in front of me, right? Many of you are in that position. Now, some of you are just the opposite. You've got more life in front of you, and you're like, yeah, someday, yeah, yeah, right? you got all those hopes and dreams. Now, look, go for it, be happy, right? And the rest of you, yeah, you know how that works. Right? Most of us aren't doing what we thought we were going to do when we were younger. Most of us haven't accomplished all that we thought we were going to. And we realize that this lifetime is not enough. You know, all of a sudden you wake up in the mirror and you got more gray hairs than whatever color originally came with. Or some of you have less hair than what you started off with. But let me tell you something. All right? In all of these things, in all these things, Christ offers eternal life through the, through the resurrection. You ever read a good book and the story goes up and down? You know, the hero or heroine, you know, starts off on a journey and something happens and it's tragedy and you're like, oh no! You don't stop reading, right? You, you read to the end of the book. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because He gives life, He gives us eternal life, that I know the last chapter of my life, and it says I'm going to be with Him forever. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more goodbyes. You know what? There's not even the word cancer in heaven. All these things. Death, where is your sting? Now let me tell you something. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't look forward to the process of dying. But praise God, I know what's on the other side. And in this, this resurrection power that he has, Romans tells us this, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give to you your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That when he comes into your life, 
He brings the power of the risen Christ into your life. He will accomplish what he tells you he will accomplish. Keep your eyes on him. You know, in my strength, I can't do it. Maybe life has brought you to the point where you're like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I'm hanging on by a thread. I'm about ready to break. God says, let me be your strength. You know, I look at the world today, and I don't know how they do it. It's no wonder why suicides are up. No wonder why depression is up. No wonder why all the, you know, alcoholism, drugs, all, all these factors are going higher and higher because people are, are trying to find an escape when they need to look to the light, the new life. Beyond the cross, by accepting Christ as your Savior, believe he died on the, on the cross for your sins, and giving your life to him, he gives you new life. Follow the light of the cross, follow the light that's coming from the tomb, and receive, receive, receive life. I have come that I may give you life, as you might have it more abundantly. Amen. Let me tell you, overcome the darkness. Look for the light of the cross. Look for the light from the tomb. The last one is follow the light on the path. You know, so many have said, Lord, I, I love you, I know you, but you've kind of just kind of left it. You've gone on, off on the path. You've gone the way of darkness. You've, you've, you've gone to find your own way. And you've fumbled and you've been hurt and you've been bruised along the way. I want to encourage you this morning that there's a path that God has for you. Stay on it. The Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Seek out his word. God, what do you want me to do? Show me what I need to be. Take me and transform me, Lord. Because I'm lost. He says, come. You know, so many people will, will scream about Christianity being so narrow and being so restrictive. Let me tell you something. I'd rather walk on the path than in the thickers and prickers and the burdocks and... Right? I mean, years ago... We were kids. We were going up uh, Mount Katarn. I don't know if you guys... I haven't been up there for years. And we're climbing up the mountain. And as we're climbing up, uh, my sister was in charge. She was probably a senior in high school, and I was five years younger than that, so you do the math. And my brother's two years younger than me, so we were much too young to be up on this mountain. And we were so close. We thought we were so close. And the game wardens came. And they're like, you guys got to get off the mountain. A storm's coming in. And my sister's like, okay, okay. And he went down through and we're like, we're going to the top. So we got off the path and decided to freelance it up the mountain. Stupid, stupid, stupid. We started going up. The, there was no longer a path. Now we're climbing rocks. The clouds came in. It started to snow. The temperature dropped. We were, we were in shorts and a t-shirt. We were freezing. We got up there and I, we didn't make it to the top. We... It was just, yeah. And then, uh, all, I remember my sister saying, she goes, we're going to die up here and no one's going to find us because we were so far off the path. And I'm got, glad God is gracious because he brought some other hiker along who saw us and said, like, what are you guys doing here? And God is onto the path and let us down. God says his word is a lamp it is the path. It shows us where to go. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus says, follow me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And maybe some of you have been looking everywhere else. Get back on the path. Back on the path. Amen. Follow the Lord. Put him first. You know, I'm often like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. 
Dorothy had one job. Follow the yellow what? Brick road. That was it. Right? How many of you guys remember that movie? We watched it every Thanksgiving for years. I think my mom just tortured us with it. And it started out, right, with this little curly. Follow the yellow, and you got the munchkins, follow the yellow brick road, follow, 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 follow. All right? And, and, she, and she's like, oh, I said, I'm following the road, yay! And then she goes off, and oh, look at the pretty flowers. And you're like, no, she's getting off the path. Right? She goes up through, into the fields, into the woods. Stick to the path. Christian. Stick to the path. Follow the Lord. Put him first. Keep your eyes on the light. And you will not be lost in the darkness. And the darkness will not overcome you. And I need to remind that. As I look at this world. And realize. All that's going on. That my eyes are on the Lord. Lord, you know what? Let this world do what it does. Let me keep my eyes on you. We sing an old song here. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Keep your eyes on him. Follow him. Follow the path. And don't wander. Because praise the Lord, what's going to come someday 1 Thessalonians gets this hope. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Folks, I want to live in the light. The Apostle John said, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. I'm thankful for a church body that we just love Jesus and we want to love you and we encourage each other to live for God. We encourage each other to look for the light. And church isn't some social club where you pass the test and you make it. No. We're all sinners saved by grace. But our goal is to follow the light. Don't let it overcome you. If you're here this morning, this is all new to you. The first step is look at the light of the cross. Jesus doesn't ask you to clean, him, clean up for him. He doesn't ask you to change. He says, just come to me. He'll take care of the rest. That his shed blood on the cross was for your punishment. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Let follow the light of the cross. If you accepted Christ as your Savior, you've asked him to forgive you. And I encourage you, look towards the tomb. There's life. Walk in the light. And it will lead you home. Let's pray. I dearly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, the darkness seems to be pressing in. But Lord, show us the light. Help us keep our eyes on the light. Keep our eyes on you to lead, guide us, and direct us. And maybe some folks here, Lord, have been, has been wandering. And maybe they're lost. Lord, let today, this Resurrection Sunday, this day that shows the power of God, that, Lord, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is able to change them, forgive them, to guide them. So today, Lord, let today be that day. And maybe there's some here who have wandered off the path. And, Lord, through prayer, just, Lord, I forgive me a sinner. I want to follow you and let today be that new start to follow the road, to follow the light. Because, Lord, you are the light. And in you is there no darkness at all. We thank you for what you're doing this morning. Thank you for those who have given of their time to come, to hear. Bless them, Lord, for this. We ask in your name.